Hey, what's up? Extra Special K here, back with another video. In this video, I'm going to show you how to bypass tethering restrictions from your cell carrier. And it's not like you need to feel bad about it either, because let's face it, data going over the pipes is data going over the pipes. It doesn't matter if it's coming from your phone or from some other nearby device. It's all data. So, uh, I'll just... I will briefly go over the requirements. The requirements are you need to have an Android phone. It needs to be rooted with using the Magisk method, which is also going to require you to unlock the bootloader because you need to flash the Magisk zip. I won't go over how to uh, unlock and root your phone here, but I will briefly touch on it. Uh, it's very similar for every Android device. You have to go into your settings. You have to look for the build. They're usually under about, and then there's build number. You tap build number a bunch of times until it says you're a developer. And then you can go back into the settings you'll see developer settings you'll see an option for oem unlocking and then another one for usb adp debugging and you'll enable both of those and that'll allow you to enter into the bootloader mode which is going to be slightly different for each phone it usually involves hitting the power button and the volume button or something until it shuts off and then you know you get some like recovery screen or something and then you plug that into your computer, you open up a console and you root um, console into your device and tap in a command like OEM unlock. Um, but some carriers require you to get a uh, special code from them before they'll let you unlock the device. And then it'll say, this is going to erase everything on your phone. Are you sure? And you say yes after you've backed everything up, of course. And then it'll unlock your phone, and then you can flash the Magisk zip. But this is not a unlocking and rooting tutorial. I'm just kind of briefly going over what's involved. I'm assuming that you have both of those things on your entry phone already. All right, so first thing you're going to do is you're going to go into Magisk. You see here we're rooted. We're going to go into the add-on settings, and then we're going to search for an add-on called SSH for Magisk. Search for it if you don't see it. And after we reboot, we're going to come back, and we're going to be able to start using it. Okay, so we're going to open up our console, we're going to use ADB to shell into our device, use SU to gain root access, we're going to CD into the directory that's supposed to have keys, data SSH root dot SSH, hit the folder, and we type out uh, clear here, clear slate. So now we're going to activate a binary for the key gen, which is right here, it's in data ADB modules SSH slash USR slash bin slash SSH key gen. And I always type up help because I can't remember half the commands for this shit. Just use it whenever I need to. All right, so it looks like uh, flag B is going to give us the size. 2048 is an okay size. Um, that's spike the standard military encryption size. For T, we're going to pick our encoding type. ED25519 is the one I generally prefer to use, but you can use RSA if you like. And F for output file, and I usually name it whatever the code name of my device is. Uh, I don't put a password in for the SSH key just because it causes problems on Windows. Not Linux, but Windows. Anyway, so if we do cat, uh, we see here that we've generated a couple of files here. We've generated hot dog and hot dog dot pub. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to print hotdog.pub into a file in the same location called authorized keys, which is as I've just done. And if we cat catalog both hotdog pub and SSH or authorized keys, we see, yeah, it's the same data. So that's all we've done is copy the inside into that uh, authorized keys file. And then in the private key, easiest thing to do is just print it on your screen, copy it, and we'll copy that to a file on our local machine. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a new text file on our machine and we're going to copy the key, the private key that we just copied, right? and we're going to paste that into our new text file. We're going to save and close it and we're going to get rid of the extensions. Here's the deal. In order to initiate this SSH connection, we are going to be using a program called PuTTY, which is used commonly for Windows and I'm assuming you're following along in Windows. Now, PuTTY does not like natively generated open SSH keys. It just doesn't. So we're going to have to convert it into a key that PuTTY does like. Thankfully, PuTTY comes with a converter program, so it's not hard. So what we're going to do is we're going to convert this key into a key that PuTTY does like, and then we're going to import it into PuTTY from there. But let's go ahead and get started. So as we can see here, I've got my uh, blank folder. I'm going to create a new text file. I'm going to give it a name, hot dog, and I'm going to paste the private key into this text file. I'm going to save and close it. All 
All right, now we've got our putty key gen. Uh, we're gonna file, or yeah, yeah, we're gonna go to convert, and we're gonna import key. We're gonna import this private key into here. See it there, right? And then we're gonna go over to save private key, and we're gonna give it a .ppk extension. And this isn't necessary, but you can also save the public key as well. You don't need to, but you can if you want to. And just give it a .pub extension. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, we can go ahead and delete our private key and our public key. Remember, we've already copied the contents of the public key to our authorized underscore keys file. Now we're going to back out two folders. So we're going to be in data slash SSH, which is where the configuration file is. And we're going to use V to edit that. Uh, if you have nano on your machine, you can use that as well. But I like V. All right, so let's take a look at the configuration file here. I won't go over all the options, but I'll go over some of the most important ones. You'll notice here we have the port option, which is 22. Uh, that just controls which port the program is going to listen on. We don't need to change that. You'll notice it says address family. On mine, it says inet. It, on yours, it probably says any. So what's the difference? Well, any means either IPv4 or IPv6, which is kind of the new supposed to be the new internet protocol standard. Uh, a lot of people have some strong opinions about it, myself included. Um, personally, I just like to, I, because I generally only want to work with IPv4 addresses, I just cut them out of the mix by replacing any with INET. INET just means listen on IPv4 addresses only. If you want to know what an IPv6 address looks like, just type in a bunch of random numbers and letters with some colons in there, and that's basically what it looks like. So under listen address you'll see what that is is it's a way to control okay what do we want our program to listen to? what address do we want our program to listen on now because we're going to be accessing this server usually over some kind of direct connection uh we're going to be uh, yours probably won't be as populated as mine because uh, I added quite a few custom addresses on there, that's fine. You'll notice that there's a hashtag in front of them. Hashtag literally comments the command out. In any case, it's not being read in the actual configuration file. It literally, it's, it's a way to comment out a command. Um, you can also use it to leave notes for yourself as well. Very useful. So anyway, so you'll see where it says listen address. Now, you'll notice there's one that says 000. zero, zero. That means any address, any IPv4 address, any network address that you have, except incoming connections from that address. Uh, but in this case, because we are only going to be connecting to this thing through direct connection, we're going to go ahead and uncomment the address for 127.0.0.1 because that's the default internal loopback address that external uh, connections cannot access. So that's why we're going to go ahead and have it listen only on that one. And that'll be a, a great way to limit the extent to which this program is listening for incoming connections on different uh, network interfaces. Uh, as I said before, um, you'll see uh, anything that has a hashtag in front of it is basically not being read. So if you want to remove an option without actually deleting it, you just put a hashtag in front of it and it won't read it. So it's coming down here. Okay, so there's a couple options here that we're interested in. You'll notice there's one option for subsystem SFTP, internal SFTP. We don't don't make any changes to that. It's just something to take note of for later. Uh, basically, not only are you going to be able to access the internet through your phone, you're also going to be able to use if you have an S, uh, an FTP program like FileZilla, you'll be able to use that to actually um, move files back and forth from your phone um, at the root level. Won't that be fun, huh? And of course, FTP is usually a little bit more stable than just Windows Explorer copy paste. So, but the main option here that we are interested in changing, uh, you'll want to look through your file for an option. Uh, it's an option called permit tunnel, and it probably says no, and it might even be hashtag out. If that's the case. Definitely remove the hashtag in front of it, and definitely make sure it says yes. Also, it also there's the option for use DNS, which you see a little bit higher up. If that's a no, go ahead and change that to a yes as well. All right, so that's all we need to talk about in regards to uh, the configuration file. Now this server is going to boot up automatically every time you start up your phone, which if you're like me, maybe you want rather start that server manually, otherwise it's going to be running even when you're not using it and it's going to be using up battery life. 
So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into that folder that we're in right here. We're gonna type out ls, and you see here a list of all the files. You'll notice there's a file here called no auto start, and that tells the server not to automatically start. So we're gonna do touch dash no dash auto start, and then when we create that file, what happens is it just tells the server, hey, don't automatically run every time we boot up the phone. Wait for us to tell you to run. Now, the way you manually run the server is you call the init script, which is data slash adb slash modules slash ssh slash open sshd dot init. You can either type start, stop, or restart. So, also, we see here, we look at the ssh dot pid file. That actually means that the server is running. All right, now this next part here is very important. What we're going to do is we need to forward the port from our phone to our computer. So what we're going to do is we're going to type out ADB forward, and then we're going to type TCP colon, and we're going to give a port number. In this case, I'm going to type out 22, and then another TCP colon 22. Now here's the deal. Here's the important thing to remember. The second port that we list, that's the remote port. That's the port on the phone that we're gonna use. And then the first time you type it out, that's the port on the local computer that we're gonna use. So if you have a Windows computer, you don't really need to pay too much attention to this. Just type out the command exactly as I type it out. But if you're on a Unix machine, uh, you may find that port 22 may already be in use, in which case it's not a big deal. You just pick a different port, um, like, I don't know, 3554 or something like that. Some, some big number here, it'd probably be okay. And then we're going to hit enter and if you successful you're going to see uh, the port number that uh, we're listening on uh, listed down below in the my case port 22. now we're going to come to our putty ssh session and for the host name i'm going to type in root at localhost and for save sessions we're going to type out a new uh, preset for this particular ssh configuration and we're going to click save and then we're going to go down here uh, we're going to add the key that we created earlier under authentication, private key file for authentication. Click browse, uh, navigate to where you save the PPK file. And we're going to go ahead and under tunnels, we're going to go ahead and type in a source port. Uh, anything with a high number is good. 3554 should work fine. We're going to click dynamic and we're going to click add. Uh, you can just ignore the other ones up there. They're for other purposes. And of course, I've already created mine. Uh, you can also set it to be IPv4 only if you want. It's not a requirement though. I'm gonna click save again. We're gonna save that preset. And we're gonna click open. And now we'll be greeted with a new window, which just means that our SSH session is up and running. We actually don't need to do anything inside this window. We just need to keep it open. But if you want to type in any basic commands just to prove to yourself that the session is active, you can. All right, guys, so we've got a proxy set up. So how are we going to connect to it? Well, that's what this part is all about. And I'm going to try and keep this as simple as possible. Um, I will tell you, though, if you have a VPN on your computer, uh, and you have like a, a program on your computer that helps you connect to your VPN. Here's what I would do. I would check the settings of that program to see if it has proxy settings in it. And if it does, then you can actually tell your computer to connect to the VPN through this SOX proxy that we just set up. Um, and in my opinion, that's the easiest way if you want to redirect all of your computer's traffic to go over the proxy. Uh, short of that though, I'm just going to show you how to have your web browser connect. Now, if you're a good little boy or girl and you're one of using and you want to protect your yourself and your family and use the web the way God intended, you probably use Firefox. If that's the case, here's how you connect to the Socks proxy through Firefox. We're going to go to here, settings. All right, we're going to come down and close settings. And we're going to go to manual proxy configuration. And you see, I already have mine set up here. But yeah, we're going to type in SOX5. This is the most important part with the SOX host. You can either type in this address right here, or if that's a little bit too complicated for you to remember, you can just do local host. Other one. They both point to the same thing. Um, and the port here, uh, whatever you used for your uh, SOX port, uh, in my case, 3554. Um, remember, you use whatever you used in your PuTTY uh, SOX forwarding port. Remember that from earlier. All right, so that's how you do it on Firefox and you just click OK and then just start using the web. And now 
if you're like most people, you probably use Google Chrome. So if you use Google Chrome, the Sox proxy, uh, the proxy settings for Google Chrome are actually linked to your Windows proxy settings. So we'll go ahead and we'll search here in the settings for proxy. And it says right here, open your computer's proxy settings. So we see here, we come to settings and then we would just type in localhost 3554. Um, and I would say, yeah, don't use this for local uh, addresses. Uh, that just means uh, don't use the proxy to connect to other computers on the same local network that you are on. That's all that means. Um, and then you click save. And that's, that's it. It's that simple. And you start browsing the web. All right, now we're going to do a little comparison and contrast here. And uh, first, we're gonna, I'm going to show you a couple of videos I recorded earlier of me using the regular tether function on the phone and using the SOX proxy that we just set up. All right, so first we have the regular, this is the regular tether phone tether method, right? And uh, we see here, we come here, we hit uh, tether, uh, we load up the speed test, and away we go. All right, let's see how lightning fast this is. Oh yeah, look at, look at that. Oh, look at that, almost a whole megabit. Oh man, what is it? This, is, this is enough to rival those DSL speeds, huh? Oh, look at that. I think I think I used to be on CenturyLink. I used to get like three megabits with that one. All right, now we're gonna, we're gonna try again. We're gonna turn this off and we're gonna try again using the SOX proxy method that I told you guys about. We just set up. All right, this is the new method. Let's see what we get. Whoa! That's a bit of a difference here now, isn't it, huh? We've gone from under a megabit to over almost 83, 86, 80, okay, 182 megabits. And upload speeds, probably, what is it? Like, yeah, it's basically 20, 20 megabits upload speed. Yeah, that's uh, at a ping of nearly zero. That's a tremendous difference. That is an incredibly noticeable difference. You can't not notice that difference in speed. Last but not least, this thing also comes with a, an SFTP server, which stands for Secure File Transfer Protocol. What we're going to do is we're going to open up FileZilla. We're going to go to Settings. We're going to go to New Site. Now we're going to choose SFTP for our File Transfer Protocol. Uh, host name, local host, and port, same port as you had before. Logon type is going to be key file. The username is going to be root. And we're going to browse. We're going to pick our key file just like we did for SSH and PuTTY. And then we're going to click connect. And voila, now we can see the root directory of our Android device. And we can move uh, very large files over to and from anywhere on our Android device. This actually works a lot better than the Windows Explorer copy and paste method. And there you have it. There you have it guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video, it certainly took me long enough to make it. I did everything I could to make it as short as possible and it's still over 20 minutes, or at least getting close to 20 minutes. Anyway, uh, if you have any questions or if you need any help, feel free to drop a question in the comment section. I'm happy to answer any simple questions you might have and uh, let me know what other kind of tutorials you'd like to see or you'd like to see me comment on any other tech uh, how-tos or what to do or things like that. Anyway, um, this video definitely took me a really long time to make, so if you got anything out of it, or if you have any constructive criticisms, you know, I'm all ears for that as well, um, but I really appreciate it uh, if you leave a like and a comment and subscribe. All right, <laughs> I'll talk to you again in the next video. See you soon.